It's August 11th, 3114 BC, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that the Maya people began their calendar with the dream that 5,000 years later it would be used to fuel internet chain messages. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was one of only three calendars, actually, that the Maya people had. They had a 260-day ritual calendar, um, so that was specifically just for religious ceremonies. Then they had a 365-day, you'll recognise that number if you pay attention, <laughs> to the solar calendar, um, which was their agricultural <laughs> calendar. Um, and then they had this, which was a really complex calendar that stretched for thousands of years. And apparently the 11th of August, if you were to transliterate it into what we now have as a Christian calendar, would be the date on which they started measuring. Is that right? Yes. And even they would have been tracking back to a moment in time that was relatively arbitrary in a sense, because, you know, no one actually sits down and goes, OK, kick off the calendar. And now it's zero, 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 zero. <laughs> yeah. Let's go forward from here. <laughs> And this particular calendar was called the Long Count. And if you're thinking all this calendar business sounds complicated, you'll be really. It doesn't to, know to me, Rebecca. I've got three calendars at home. I have a page a day <laughs> desk calendar, which is cats, yep. that I have in the office. Yep. Then I've got my file of facts that I carry around mm. in my uh, bag just for personal mm. meetings. And then uh -huh. in the kitchen, we have a family planner with a column for everybody and what we're doing socially. So I'm a three calendar man. Well, OK, well, think of the long count as being the family calendar, because the long count was used for events that were taking place for a long span of history, like different kings, etc. But if you're thinking this all sounds a bit complicated, you'll be relieved to know that the way it works is very, very simple. You've got <laughs> 20 kings to a winnel. 18 winnels to a ton, 20 tons to a cartoon, 20 cartoons to a back tune, and it's all expressed using a modified base 20 system. So, for example, <laughs> today's date in long calendar Maya terms is 13-0-8-11-4, which is 13 back ton, 0 caton, 8 ton, <laughs> 11 uinel, and 4 kin. I'm sure I didn't even need to spell that out to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I find it kind of reassuring. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not living in ancient man civilization, obviously, but I would find that reassuring if I were, because... Uh, well, it's a bit like the Jewish calendar, isn't it? It goes to, I think it's now 5,781. So it just gives you a sense of like, okay, so Jesus was born in 3760. That doesn't seem that long ago. Like it gives you a different <laughs> perspective than the Christian calendar, doesn't it? Because yes, it goes back to the 11th of August, 3114 BC. But also apparently they had even much bigger concepts of time than that. Even now, like if you ask someone at NASA, when was the Big Bang? They'd say, oh, that was about 13 billion years ago. The Mayan calendar has a date a billion, billion years further back than that. So this is like a completely different yeah. concept, not for the Big Bang, obviously, because you know what that was, but for the creation of the world. So they really were playing the long game. I and mean, we're not even touching on how much the ancient Maya loved calendars, because they had short calendars <laughs> as well. They had other religious calendars. My impression is that the reason that the Mayan civilization was... It has often been seen as a mystical civilization, and it has been associated with a lot of prophecy, which I'm sure we'll get to in a minute. But I think it's a combination of the fact that they were very advanced in astronomy and really, really fond of calendars, and also that their language wasn't really deciphered substantially until the 60s through to you know the present day, really. It was only in the 70s and 80s that most of the inscriptions could be translated. So it was this allure of what seemed almost like a lost civilization, you know, that when we couldn't mm. tell what they were saying, what mysterious messages they'd left. And actually, as they've been deciphered, most of them are about the exact same things that you'd find in ancient Egypt or Babylonia, you know, their lists of kings or that kind of thing, which has kind of disappointed those people who are clinging on to the idea that they, yeah. they were this great, wise, lost civilization. It turns out they were, they were just like all the other civilizations. That reminds me of doing Anglo-Saxon literature, by the way, in my English degree. <laughs> like, everyone's really excited. Like, this is the first piece of English literature. And you're like, wow, what <laughs> mystical thing has someone scribed? And you right. read it and you spend hours translating it. And it's literally like, Alfred was a guy who came from Kent and then he stabbed Brian. Or when they finally uh, decoded the Babylonian script, they found that people were really just kind of writing contracts with each other. It was like super yeah. basic forms of communication and not in the least exciting. Although we would know more about what they'd thought and written uh, if the Europeans hadn't decided to burn all their books, gleefully. Uh, I found this account of um, Diego de Landa, who was a Franciscan friar from Spain who arrived in Yucatan in the 1540s. 
Uh, he says, We found a large number of books in their letters, and because they had nothing in which there was not superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they <laughs> regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them sorrow. And the other interesting aspect about it is that as soon as they did manage to decode what the Maya were up to and what their thinking was, it exposed the fact that they were intensely logical. They weren't these sort of airy, fairy, spiritual people. They had this sort of ahead of their time grasp of mathematics and, as you say, Rebecca, astronomy and, uh, and also chocolate and hallucinogenic drugs. Um, so they were really like this super advanced culture. And in terms of the stuff that underpinned their calendar work in particular, it was really subtle uh, comprehension of the movement of the sun and the moon and the stars. And it was way ahead of its time, actually. They did still do some pretty primitive stuff, though. I mean, <laughs> let's not gloss over that by saying how advanced they were. I mean, they did cranial deformation, didn't they? Which is where you take a baby, strap its head into a vice so that it develops like a pointy head because that was uh, seemed to be desirable because, you know, it would show the quality of having a big brain. What I don't really understand about that, and it wasn't just the Maya who did that, lots of cultures did it, but what I don't understand about it is if you do that, then you know that it's not a naturally big brain, don't you? you like, you just, you know, if you're courting and you see, she's, oh, she's got a big brain. No, her parents put her face in a vice. Like, that's what's sure. happened. Why is that but, desirable? Yeah, but even in our culture, we know that certain people have put literal silicon sacks in their front mm. area and that, <laughs> and that is meant to be attractive as well. Yes, okay. Touche. <laughs> they had a ball game as well called Ulama. Have you come across this? No. No. It's like basketball, basically. But it's just funny because, you know, when you're growing up in England, you know, you're told, aren't you, all the time, oh, we invented rugby, we invented cricket, we invented soccer, as if sports didn't exist before the English <laughs> start kicking around pig's bladders. <laughs> but actually, thousands of years ago, they were playing a version of basketball. It was like on, on an eye-shaped court. They played it recreationally, but also they played it for uh, ritual sacrifice. So I'm not sure it was always great fun. I think sometimes <laughs> the loser <laughs> was burned. Murder right. um, <laughs> Maya but, space jam. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the game was you play. You weren't allowed to play with your hands and your feet. So they had a rubber ball. They developed rubber balls mm -hmm. like thousands of years before we did. Nice work. And um, you had to use your hips, your knees, and your elbows to try and get it through the hoop. Oh, that sounds fun. And not be put to death if you failed. Oh, but that's less fun. The most famous feature of the Mayan calendar, as you will probably remember, is the supposed apocalyptic date of December the 21st, mm. 2012. Mm -hmm. This idea was actually, I was quite surprised to learn, this was first floated in the 1960s by Michael D. Coe, who was a respected academic. And he certainly didn't say the world's going to end on this date. He just suggested that perhaps the Maya expected some kind of important event on this date, because this marks the end of the 13th Baktun. So a Baktun is roughly 394 years. This idea comes from a collection of uh, Mayan creation legends uh, that said that we are living in the fourth world, created by the gods, and the previous world had lasted 13 Bactons. So the idea was that when this world reached 13 Bactons and we transitioned to the fifth world, something might happen. Most modern academics believe that the Maya didn't think anything particular would happen. We'd just, it would be like, almost like when we celebrated the new millennium. It would just be a new... Yeah, just a really big party. Yeah, <laughs> like it's a really significant New Year's Eve. That's all it is, isn't it? But it was interpreted as, oh, they've plotted for this calendar to... I mean, it's misconceived because people thought that the calendar was going to end. It's not that it ends. It's like an odometer in the car, isn't it? It goes over, like mm. it goes back to the beginning again. This whole topic, even the concept of our very podcast begin to... I love the comparison of our <laughs> podcast to Mayan civilization. Well, I just, I just felt like suddenly the which house... Which of our episodes is the equivalent of the Chichen Itza? <laughs> yeah. The house of cards upon which we have built this whole thing, which is, you know, that we remember dates from history that are recurring in this regular mm. way, uh, that, you know, even that concept is so baked into a particular conception of time. And once you start looking at calendars and different calendar systems, not just the Maya, you know, there have been loads of them the minute you start to think about them conceptually you kind of go well what you know wh what does it mean to, to have time recurring and I think that is what kind of gets you into those points where you're like 
is something profound going to happen when the calendar rolls over from 1999 to 2000? Because we know in our brains that it's a really arbitrary date, but there is something that you can't help but feel is recurring. I mean, as we established on Monday, Rebecca, neither of us have been for a naked run with Arian, but I feel like <laughs> if ever we did and then we inhaled a lot of marijuana, we'd be having this conversation at two in the morning, lying Quite on a possibly. beach, looking at the stars. Oh, man. Yeah, but the calendar's just made up, man. Like, money's just a concept. <laughs> there was definitely a time where a friend and I uh, tried to recreate a whole new time system around decimal <laughs> because we thought the whole thing was a mess. It was a long train journey. We had a lot of time on our hands. Uh, that's my excuse. Tomorrow. You really weren't going to this place to be treated, but to be isolated and experimented on, frankly. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. <laughs>